Hey folks, it is Carla again, and we are trying to do this interview with Jeff Griffin and make it work. Hopefully this time it'll work. This is take three. Jeff is a very interesting man. He is from West Jordan, Utah. He was in an accident and paralyzed from the waist down. And he's going to tell us the story that is absolutely amazing. Now, I am hoping I can add him. Um, and before I forget, let me tell everyone this show is sponsored by the Institute of Peace, which is an online organization creating peace throughout the world, one conversation at a time. Can you hear me, Jeff? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So let's start again. Can you introduce yourself, who you are, at what you do, and what your journey was going from non-walking to walking and how you got to that point. Yeah, absolutely. And Carla, thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm excited to get to, to know your followers. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to give some value to them in their life. And, uh, and I love the fact that you are, are helping people find the joy in reading, find the joy in life. And, uh, you know, that's part of my passion and desire is to um, amplify the power and potential in a million people by 2020. Um, to, to, you know, I'm physically paralyzed, as you mentioned, but I think most of us, Carla, are paralyzed from the demons of doubt, fear, and complacency. Um, and so... Um, that's that's what I'm excited to, to do here. Now, are you able to still hear me or is it? Uh, is it no problem. On? No problem. If there was a problem, I would have told you by now. OK, well, I just wanted to make sure because this is take three. And, uh, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, um, so, yeah. So um, as was mentioned, my name is Jeff Griffin. And yes, I am in a wheelchair. I know you can't see that. But um, I wasn't always in a wheelchair. And um, the doctors, in between football seasons, I was a D1 football player. And um, in between what seasons... What is a D1 football player? Yeah, so, so you've got the, the D1 level, which is like the Florida, the Penn State, the uh, um, Washington, the BYU, uh, the Utah State uh, um, schools. And um, so those are the top, the, the top colleges in sports and athletics. And that was my dream was to play football in college. And, and um, I told somebody my dream one time and they're like, Griff, you cannot play football. You're too short. You're too slow. You're too white. And, uh, and I'm like, well, okay, well, I am almost all three of those, but it doesn't mean I have to be. And um, one thing I discovered is, and, I, and this took, this took my, my accident to, to discover this, but I didn't realize at the time, but we as individuals, we reject what we don't understand and we base our possibilities on what we know. And so there's the problem and there's the paradox, right? Most of us sit back and say, you know what? I'm not going to start doing it until I know what's going to happen, but it's never going to happen unless we take those steps into the darkness long before we've ever see the end. And so, um, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I, but I continued to tap into and fill uh, the reserves of resilience. And I kept on chasing down my dream. And then uh, one day after practice my senior year, I got a letter from the legendary Hall of Fame coach, Lavelle Edwards, inviting me, the short, slow white guy, to come play uh, at BYU. And uh, I tasted what the sweetness of BYU? success. What is BYU? So BYU is Brigham Young University. It's a school in, uh, in Provo, Utah. They won the national championship in 1984. And, um, and, and they're a passing school. And I was a receiver. And, uh, and that was my passion was to, uh, 
to go and, and uh, play football down there and hope to play catch with the next uh, All-American quarterback from uh, Brigham Young University. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, and so, uh, and so that's just kind of the lead up of, of, of what happened, right? Because, you know, um, in between seasons, I was up, uh, I was like, what can I do to earn some money? And so I decided to start my own business and that was painting, not pictures, but buildings. And um, I'm from Northern Utah and I got a phone call from the Napoleon Dynamite country, which is across the border in Preston, Idaho. And um, three days later and $3,000 richer, I'd have enough money to, to go back to school and to also bull, buy a bullet bike. I always wanted a bullet bike. I always thought the ladies dug the wheels. It wasn't until my accident that I realized that the ladies dig the wheels. And, um, and so, you know, I went up there, we, we put some scaffolding together and we put uh, a 30 foot ladder on top of that. I wanted to get the tall parts of the barn done first. And, and, uh, I, you know, I just, I was just kind of wanting to, to get things done quick. And by doing that, I cut corners. And when I was up on top of the scaffolding, the ladder and scaffolding slipped out from underneath me. And I fell 40 feet. And wow. Stuck the landing perfect if I was a gymnast, but I'm not. So my legs came up, my back came down, and my L1 vertebrae exploded inside me. And um, as, I, as I crumbled to the ground, the pain was just excruciating. I, and I reached down to alleviate the pain, and I grabbed onto my leg with my hand, and my hand could feel my leg but my legs could not feel my hand and I knew something was, was up instantly. And uh, I didn't know quite what it was, but um, after I eventually got to the hospital, I realized that I had broken my back. I paralyzed, uh, you know, I had severed my spinal cord and it left me paralyzed from the waist down. And the doctors gave me a 0% chance of ever walking, ever moving, ever standing again. My, la my life changed just like that. Wow. That, <laughs> I don't think I could have handled that. How did you feel when that happened? Were you feeling down or? Yeah, I, you know, it was one of those experiences and one of those moments that, um, that, you know, people are like, well, did you, did you experience some depression? Did you experience those, uh, those dark days? And, um, and the answer is absolutely. In fact, I, I wrote a book called I'm Possible. Um, in fact, it's, it's, I have it right here with me. It, it, it has a student study guide with it, and it has some battle cry bracelets in it as well. And uh, the book's called I'm Possible, Desire, Dream, and Do. And um, it took three weeks, three months to write, but 10 years to get the confidence to actually publish it. Um, just for the fact that in sixth grade, I had a D minus in English. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to laugh at that. No, Go absolutely. On. No, that's perfect, right? Yeah, you know, I got a D minus in English in sixth grade. In high school, my English teacher's like, Griff, you'll never write a comprehensive sentence. And then when I got to college, all that was validated in my freshman English class. When I, when I showed up on the first day of English class and we wrote that paragraph, and the next day, six of us were called to the back, six out of 300. And I go back there because my name was called and I get back there, I'm like, what I win? And uh, the teacher's like, you want to date with the remedial English teacher? And uh, to, to show you how little English I understood, I looked at her and I'm like, what does that mean? And she's like, that's exactly <laughs> why you need this class. So, uh, and so, yeah, so I, I wrote the book in three, in three months, but it took me 10 years to get the confidence to publish it. We're in our uh, second printing. We're almost finished with that. We're going to print another... Uh, um, another 5,000 this time and I'd love to give a copy to your, your listeners who are in the United States shipping on the outside of the United States is, is crazy. And I haven't figured that out yet, but, uh, those who are in the United States and want a book just for you, Carla, since you are just showing the love, um, if people go to my website at griffinmotivation.com, that's G R I F F I N motivation.com and go to the bottom of the website or just go 
griffinmotivation.com forward slash shop. Um, if you put in the coupon code love, just because you are uh, just helping so many people out there, Carla, I want to share a little love to, to them as well. And uh, they can get anything in my, uh, my shopping cart or anywhere on my website, 50% uh, off that coupon code love will uh, will uh, take off 50% off and they can get my book. There's an ebook, there's an audio book, or there's a hard copy for those who are in the United States. Those who are outside the United States, you can go there and get the digital or the audio. Same thing, love um, will uh, knock off 50%. But you, um, I mentioned in that book, um, I, I call it, I mean, I, I use mile markers instead of chapters because I believe we're all on a journey. And we're all trying to climb uh, what I call our, our Everests. You know, we're all trying to climb the Everests. If it's social, if it's emotional, if it's physical, if it's spiritual, whatever it is, we all have an Everest to climb. And, um, and so, you know, instead of trying to get all the way to the top at once, you can take them a step at a time or a section at a time. So at the end of each mile marker, there's an invitation of something that I discovered, some flecks of gold that they can take, and then they can forge into some gold nuggets that will uh, um, that will help enrich their life, enrich their bank account, enrich whatever it might be. But uh, one of those mile markers, Carla, was called the sauna of self-pity. Um, I hmm. entered that syrupy, sticky sauna of self-pity after my accident, and and I had a pity party like no other. I was inviting everybody who would come join me and um, the irony of it all was um, there was a prisoner at the hospital that was lifting weights in prison, had an aneurysm, and paralyzed the right side of his body. He couldn't speak. And it was that prisoner that set me free from my prison. And, um, and after that experience that I had with him, um, my life just changed. My thinking, um, I was able to see things I wasn't able to see before. I was able to see my accident and my paralysis as a blessing instead of a hurdle. And How so, did uh, that happen? Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. And so what's interesting is, is, is I, I've been in Sweden about four, four months ago. And that's where I met our, our friend who, who is in common and uh, <laughs> we were there at the uh i was there at the eighth world congress of mind training and and a lot of us think that this process has to be a long drawn out situation and it doesn't it can happen just like that it can happen like you know what all of a sudden this is how i think but no boom something happens and then we see something uh, that we didn't see before and that's what happened to me when, you know, they wouldn't feed me in the hospital anymore after my accident. So I, I had to get up out of my bed and go to the to the uh, cafeteria if I wanted to eat. And so it took 30 minutes. Why wouldn't, for, well, why wouldn't they feed you? Oh, they would feed me, not in bed, but they would feed me in the cafeteria. And so if I wanted to eat, I had to get out of bed and, uh, and go to the cafeteria. Was that a motivation to get you out of bed? You know, looking back, I'm sure it was. Yeah, I'm sure it was. They wanted to get me to move as fast as I could. And, and uh, you know, it took 30 minutes for the nurses to get me out of bed, two of them. And, uh, and we transferred into my wheelchair. And then I remember heading down those sterile halls of the hospital. And um, I was just crying. The tears were just, you know, dripping down my cheeks. And... I get to the cafeteria. I don't want to be around anybody. I get a tray. I go get my food. I'm flavoring my food with my tears. And um, I'm just wanting to be away from everybody that I possibly can. And um, I don't understand why they wouldn't let you eat in your room. Was there a reason for that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Other than it's probably, as you mentioned before, that they uh, they don't want us to be sedentary. They want they don't want us to lie there when when we're trying to um, do some physical therapy and and uh, and recover like that. So, but it was a blessing in disguise, right? Because 
when I got my tray, I went as far away as from the people as I possibly could. And I put my tray down and I was flavoring my food some more with my tears. And then there's this tray that plops right in front of me. And I was about to look up and tell that person to, to go away with some very colorful language. And, um, <laughs> and, and this on. guy looks, this guy looks back at me and he's like, why are you crying, dude? And I'm like, what? And I stopped crying. So I was trying to understand what he was saying. He's like, why are you crying, dude? And in his slurred speech, he was asking me, why am I crying? And also that simple question snapped me out of it. It snapped me out of my, my pity party. It snapped me out of what in, internal thinking. All I was doing was thinking about myself. I was, all I was doing was, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? And all of a sudden, I looked around and I noticed that there was people who had it worse off than me. There was a man who was paralyzed from the neck down and he couldn't even move. He had to sit there and he was fed by somebody. And, uh, and then there was another guy who was paralyzed from the, way, the neck down, but he had some movement in his hand. And they had taped a fork to his hand and he, and he was trying to eat his food. And by the time he got the food to his mouth, all the food was gone and, you know, he was struggling. And I looked around and, then, and I'm like, there are so many more people out there that has it so worse than me. Why don't I look up? Why don't I look and focus on what I can do instead of what I can't do? And what I could do is move my hands. What I could do is I could give some hugs. What I could do is I could transfer out of my wheelchair and I could uh, push down the halls. And what I could do was a lot of things that other people could not do. And I didn't see those things before. And so that, uh, so that prisoner um, with that simple question, why are you crying, dude? Snap me out of it. And I haven't returned back to that, uh, that sauna of self-pity. And um, I have some tough days, but I've, I've never had another, I've never had another pity party since then. How old were you when this happened? Do you mind? Yeah, so I was 21, 22, somewhere around there. I don't remember. It's been, uh, it's been a, a couple decades ago. And, um, and but uh, I was, I was, in, in really great shape. Uh, some might say the prime of my life. And that was all taken in an instant. And, and I learned something, Carla, that day that uh, when you cut corners, so many, so many times we want to, we want to obtain the prize that we're willing to cut corners and, and do things that uh, will compromise our success. And I learned for myself that cutting corners leads nowhere but down. And so instead of trying to cut corners, we need to establish and build a solid foundation, a solid frame that will hold our dreams, that will hold our desires, that will sustain um, that vision um, throughout our life. Wow. Now, you said earlier, I don't know if it was on air anymore because we've been off and on so many times that no one expected you to get married. No one expected you to do any of the things you're doing. How did you, what was the motivation that got you where you were, where you are now? And why didn't they expect you to get married? What was the problem with that? <laughs> Well, yeah, as I, as I said before, I, you know, the doctors gave me a 0% chance of walking and standing or ever moving my legs again. The doctors gave me a 0% chance of ever having kids. And, and I added the fact that there are some people who gave me a 0% chance of getting married, not because of my wheelchair, but just because of who I am. And, uh, and so, um, you know, my personality, right, uh, sometimes it, it may not mesh, but I like to tell people if I can get married, you can get married. And uh, we've been married 20 plus years. We have four kids, four more than the doctors told us we could. And now, Carla, um, with all the work that I've done, I can now get up out of my chair and I can walk across the stage or, as I like to say, waddle with swagger. 
Now, let's go back to this, the woman you ended up marrying. Did you know her prior to the accident or was this all post-accident? Um, yeah, so there's a bro code out there and, um, uh, I don't know if it's, if, if it's lived anymore, but, uh, you know, you, you, you never, you never steal your best friend's girl. Right. Um, right. so when I, when I was in the hospital, my best friend would come and talk to me about this girl in his psychology class, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in his, uh, psychology class. And I'm like, Hey, go for it. That's awesome. So when I got out of the uh, hospital, and went back to school. He was walking me to my class and she was coming from her class. And uh, he's like, that's her. That's the girl I was telling you about. And, uh, you know, there's a bro code. You don't do anything right. And so I, I looked at her and I'm like, yeah, she's a cute, she's a cute girl. Go for it. And uh, not saying that I'm great with the ladies, um, but uh, he was, he struggled a little bit more than I did. And so he was just standing there after he introduced us. And so I was trying to gently push him towards her. But apparently what I had done is I pushed him past her and put me right directly in her, in her uh, line of vision. And, and um, you know, her words, not mine. She, uh, the first time she saw me, she said uh, she thought that I was hot. I, uh, you know, I, I try to remind her that all the time now because she doesn't say that too often anymore. But uh, um that's how we met, but uh, I wouldn't go out with her because I knew he liked her. And then it, it you know, it took some, uh, some um, uh, maneuvering on her part and his part and my part. When we finally like decided, you know what, you know what, this is probably what she wants. This is kind of nice. Uh, I'll be happy to take her out. And, and uh, we started to date and he was okay with that. And in fact, he became uh, the best man at my wedding. And so um, things are all good with uh, with us three, and um, it's been a it's been a beautiful beautiful journey with her and I. And how did you meet him? Was he like he, a childhood friend? Yeah, I met him in, in in high school. In fact, he was the friend who was holding the ladder when I when I climbed up it, and um, oh, no. so. Uh, we like to joke that uh, he he knew that I was going to steal his his girlfriend, and so he he uh, he he tipped me over on that uh, on that scaffolding. But uh, uh, he really didn't, and and things are good. I can honestly say, Carla, that I'm grateful to be in a wheelchair, dissatisfied but grateful. Why are you grateful for a wheelchair? That's a very, most people would say, I don't want to be in a wheelchair. And here you are saying, I'm grateful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's the obvious. Um, we get great parking at the, uh, at the front of the parking lot. And, um, yeah. and we also get to skip to, into the front of the line at the amusement parks. And uh, when I go to dances, you know, the girls have to sit on my lap. And so uh, um, we, uh, you know, I get to dance. I, I used to get to dance with the girls on my lap and, uh, you know, some innocent lap dances there. And uh, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's a few things like that that's, that's just great, that's just beneficial. But my wheelchair has taken me around the world and taken me places that, uh, me being a, a, a mainstream person or an able-bodied guy would not have taken me. I've, uh, I've been to Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm on a humanitarian committee. I've created a peer-to-peer -peer leadership um, program that has been recognized by the United Nations. And um, we, we go around the world and, and we help people climb their own Mount Everest. And so that's what I do um, humanitarian wise. And that's what I do, you know, to give back. And, uh, you know, my passion is to get on stage and to really help people understand that there is hope that they can overcome their mental paralysis and that they can orchestrate and conduct the song that sings in their soul. And, um, 
And so, you know, I don't think I'd be able to do that as powerfully as I can if I wasn't in a wheelchair. I won't always be in a chair, Carla, even though they said a 0% chance. I'm convinced that I will walk and not faint. I will run and not be weary. And I will have a full recovery in a reasonable amount of time. It's been 20 plus years, but what does reasonable mean? That's my question. What? That's my next question. What do you mean a reasonable chance? Explain it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for, for me, I thought reasonable was six months. Or actually, I thought it was three months. I was going to walk out of the hospital. I didn't. It took 15 minutes to get out of my, ch get out of my chair into the car. Um, okay. So I thought, okay, a year's reasonable, two years reasonable. It didn't happen either. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I've been chasing down this stream, but I also realized that there's other dreams that, uh, that I'm interested in as well, besides just walking. And so while I'm working on walking, I'm also working on these other dreams of, for example, I went to the Paralympics in 2004 and participated on the USA men's wheelchair basketball team. Uh, I played for the uh, wheelchair NBA league and I played for the Utah wheel and jazz. And I've been to the all-star game eight times participating in that. And I have um, four MVPs from that uh, all-star event and I have two Guinness world records. I play wheelchair tennis and um, you know, there's other things that I'm doing um, while I'm pursuing this other dream as well of, of walking and, um, you know, for me, reasonable means whenever it happens. So often people keep coming to me and says, Griff, your dream is delusional. But to me, what's, what's more delusional than to not dream at all? I agree. And I don't know how someone can say your dream is delusional, personally. It's yeah. your dream. And, and for, yeah. And, and, and perhaps on. it's kind of like uh, my English teachers, right? All the evidence is stacked up against me. You're not going to write a comprehensive sentence. You're not going to be able to write a book. Um, all the evidence is stacked up against me. I have a scar from my belly button all the way around my torso to my backbone that reminds me every day that uh, I have a four inch plate inside my back, two screws up on top and two screws down below. I am missing a rib because they took it out and used it as support to support my back. Uh, and so, you know, the doctor has, has reconstructed my back. He's cleaned up the shrapnel of the, uh, of the explosion of my spinal cord or my spine. And, um, and so, yeah, all the evidence is stacked up against me and not being able to move or not be able to, to flex my muscles. You know, it was all stacked up against me. And they're like, Griff, your dream is delusional. I don't know why you're thinking about that, but here's the beauty of it, Carla. Everything we do today was once deemed impossible in the past. And so my question for your listeners are, is, are you ready and willing to take the steps necessary to change your presence to improve future? You know, Madame Curie was told that there was no more elements to be found, and she found two more, plus the Nobel Prize. The Wright brothers were told that you can't control flights. Now I can get to, to your place in three and a half hours, which is amazing, right? Uh, and uh, we can get across yeah. the pond in a couple hours. And so, so really... Um, you know, what's, what hasn't been discovered, I believe, is the limitation of our own imagination. I agree with you. Um, Rayhan knows this. I am, we've met many times and he sees me walking with the walker and I want to be walking with the cane and eventually no assistance at all. And I have the days that I feel, oh, it ain't going to happen ever. And then other days, yeah. I just push myself forward. And what I find interesting in what you're saying is that I have a dream, too, and a dream to walk yeah. without assistance. 
I don't know when it will happen, but I believe it will happen. So I yeah. understand what you're saying. And if you go back in my yeah. videos, you'll see a video when I first met Rayhan that very first time. And he took it with me walking with the walker. And I got really mad. Why are you doing this? I don't want you to show it. And a week later, before I had... I was told I shouldn't drive. Yeah. And before I decided that I would go and drive, Ray had sent me this video again and said, why don't you post it? And I thought, you know what? I will. And I did not only because he was challenging me to post it, but because it was a way of saying, this is here where I am now, but I'm going to move forward. And I think our stories yeah. are a bit similar. Yeah. Except and I, and I, I don't have listener four kids. stories. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, you have four dogs and cats, right? Isn't that uh, what I... What no, I two dogs, two cats and one dog. Oh, so you're you're uh, you're only three, not four. I used to have six cats. Okay, yeah, but yeah, that absolutely. was and so. Uh... That was yeah, a go ahead. while ago. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so yeah, as you mentioned, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so often we don't want to take that step until we see the end, but we're never going to see the end until we take that step. And, um, and the first step I believe we must do is to start to dream again, to dream in color, to, uh, to open up those floodgates of imagination and, and to create that tapestry of color that's inside our, our minds that will, you know, give our heart a reason to beat. And, um, and then once we've established that dream and then we establish that vision, We've also got to be, we've got to create a consistent and resilient routine. And, and sometimes we get off course. I don't know if you've gotten off course, but I've gotten off course oh, before. Yeah. And, and we, all, we all get off course, right? And so I've got a little battle cry bracelet that I have myself. Um, on one side, it says, don't quit, capital D-O, capital I-T. And on the other side, it says, I'm possible, which looks like impossible. And so whenever we start something new for the first time, you know, here we, here's our reality and here's where, 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 where our dream is. And so the ideal is different than what's real. And so there's a gap in between there. And, uh, and so it always is going to be impossible to get here if we've never been there before. But a lot of us don't even start and begin because we don't know how or we, it, we, we're going to wait until we can see that it's going to happen. But it's never going to happen unless we take those steps. And, um, and then once we start taking those steps, we've got to have that consistency. And then for me, um, like you mentioned, you know, I wanted to, to walk again. And so the therapist is like, okay, Griff, walk. So she put me in front of the parallel bars and she had to lift me up. And it took me five minutes to get up with, with the aid of this nurse. And then she's like, walk. And I'm like, okay, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. No, I know I can. And nothing happened. And so all the evidence, of course, was stacked up against me. But then I started to move. And I noticed that she was grabbing my legs. She was lifting it up. She was pulling it forward and placing it down. She was grabbing my legs. She was lifting it up. She was pulling it forward and placing it down. She did that all the way to the end of the parallel bars. I was sweating as much as she was sweating. Sorry, she's glistening. Women don't sweat, right? And um, I collapsed in my chair and I'm like, oh, this is so hard. This is so exhausting. Maybe I don't want to walk. And, uh, and a lot of times we convince ourselves we are our own worst enemies. We are the, our yeah. worst critics, always telling us that we can't do it. And, uh, and so when I got back to my bed, I readjusted. I readjusted and course corrected. 
And, and so that's what, what this, uh, this thought came up, to, came to me that I got to get a battle cry bracelet that I can just snap myself back into um, the direction that I want to go. And, and so, you know, we just have to course correct. It's no big deal. And so for me, I have a little reminder on my wrist that, uh, that you can have, that you have a dream. You're going to get there. You might get off course and that's okay, but you can adjust your attitude, flip the switch and um, fly as high as you possibly can imagine. And um, I learned, Carla, that in the, play, the instrument that gets the plane from point A to point B is called the attitude meter. And if a plane is going from LA to New York, and if it's just off one degree, it's going to end up in Washington, DC or Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah. Not a big deal, right? unless you want to go to New York. And, uh, and so that's why it's so important to have a dream. That's why it's so important to course correct. That's why it's so important to take that first step and, um, and enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Don't just try to get to the destination. Don't just try to obtain that promise, but enjoy the process because it's in the process that we find the progress. And, um, and so you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm learning to enjoy life one step at a time. And I'm grateful to be in a chair because I know it's not always going to be that way. I'm grateful for the people and uh, that I'm going to impact and the people I meet that impact me. And, and I just love being able to, uh, to give back and forth where we're both growing. Well, I know why Ray had wanted me to speak to you now, you know, he knew that you would be an inspiration for me. And I need to get the, I got to do this. And we all can do it together, right? And that's what's the beautiful about it. Uh, I don't know if you can see my, my jersey behind me, but that's my, my, uh, yeah. my Paralympic jersey that I wore. And um, I learned that team really does mean together everyone achieves more. And so, uh, so anyway. I like that. I, yeah. I can see that I'm killing you, right? I'm, I'm killing you slowly where you're like, I'm tired. I got to get to bed. Maybe it's past your bedtime. But, uh, no, actually, I, I have. your time. Actually, I have a lot of work to do tonight still. Um, yeah. It isn't past my bedtime at all okay. um the dog needs to go out at, at least two more times because i yeah. need to walk but <laughs> okay, there you go i appreciate the time you gave me and actually i don't know if you'd be interested but i would like you to come and to the learn english by speaking english show and talk to the people who come and speak there mm -hmm. in English. Because I have people who say, I can't speak English. My accent isn't good enough. And they're speaking right. beautifully. Yeah. And they need to realize that no one speaks the same. It doesn't no. matter. You just speak. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I love what you just said there. It reminds me of just, you know, speak, uh, you know, listen to the music that sings to, sings to your soul. And, uh, you know, you and I, we speak English, but we have different accents. We have different words we use. We, uh, our vocabulary is different and, and that's okay. It's beautiful. And I, and I didn't learn how to speak English or how to write English until I went to Spain to learn Spanish. And so having to right. learn a new language, I learned that, that uh, what English was all about. And, and it's okay. It's okay to, uh, to not get the words correct all the time. Right. Someone had just started at Giggle Fest University, which is my company. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't speak English. I live in the U.S. I'm afraid to talk. And I said to him, it's not that you can't speak it. It's you're losing. You don't have the confidence. Yep. 
you need to build the confidence to do what you want to do. Yep. Keep on saying you can't and you'll never do anything. It's true. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Agree with you 100%. Uh, Okay, we have been speaking for over half an hour. Yeah. How do you feel now? Me? Yeah, you. Oh, I feel great. I I love talking to people uh, and uh, and and, um, and and hopefully helping them find that inspiration that that will spark. Uh, the etern- the eternal tinder inside them. And uh, I hope I did that. I hope I did that uh, to at least one of your listeners. I hope I did that for you. Um, I know that uh, that just being able to, to have a conversation edifies me. And so thank you, Carla, for inviting me on to your, um, your Facebook Live show. Would you consider coming to the Learn English show? Yeah, absolutely. It would be 10.30 a.m. your time. Um, on what day? I'm there Monday through Thursday for anyone of any age or gender. Friday for women only. Okay, um, set it up. And if I'm not on the road speaking, it. we'll if we find have a day. connection, I'm all over it. We will find yeah, a day. let's do it. And with that, let's wave goodbye. The show has been sponsored by the Institute of Peace, which is an online organization creating peace one conversation at a time. Bye. Thank you, Jeff. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Carla.